Thank you, Jane. So I have the great honor of introducing actually two speakers um, for this presentation for session 15, uh, Jill Darlington and Rachel Ward. Jill Darlington is midwifery lead for practice development and preceptorship at One to One Midwives. She has been a practicing midwife for over eight years and joined One to One Midwives in 2014 as a caseloading midwife. Jill's passion lies with offering fully informed choices for all families, in particular clients requiring complex care, planning, and that she believes that a holistic approach to maternity care involves empowering not only service users, but midwives as well. Jill and her husband have three boys whose love for sport keep Jill on her toes, as you can imagine. Welcome, Jill. And Rachel, her co-presenter is Rachel Ward. Rachel Ward is the midwifery lead for screening and immunization. She has been a midwife for over six years. She joined one-to-one -one midwives as a caseloading midwife with a passion for informed choice and consent. This suits the caseloading case -loading model of care. She is also the mother of a two-year-old named Winnie. Um, whom she says delights she and her partner every day. So Rachel and Jill, I'll hand it over to you. Welcome. Hi, Cindy. Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear us. Um, <laughs> hello. Hi, Zainab. It'd be lovely if you could just all quick put in the public chat that you can hear us just to give us a bit of a boost of confidence. Rachel is also here. Hello. <laughs> Okay, we will quickly go through this slide. This is just our title page and we'll take you to the next one, which will show our lovely faces. So Cindy very lovely then gave you our background so we can whiz past this slide quite quickly and get to the nitty gritty of the presentation. Um, thank you very, very much for inviting us to be part of the VIDM and thank you all for joining us today. Um, it is something that needs celebrating every single year. Okie doke. So we work for one to one midwives, which is a case loading model of care, meaning that midwives get to spend time with their women to, um, and they're named midwife all the way through. But why is case loading important? It's very big news at the moment. So we've got the likes of Better Births here in the UK, which is supported alongside with the NHS long term plan. Better Births came through a few years ago in order to push forward better care for women, midwives and their families. Um, continuity care has been a huge uh, push within this just to be able to go back. I feel it's almost like going back a few decades to the care that midwives used to provide. Um, it is very much a social model of care and it is really important. The likes of Hannah Darlin, Jane Sandal, so many researchers have pushed for continuity of care and the importance of it for many years now. Here at One to One, we've been able to implement that um, and keep up with the pace and go above and beyond where we should be according to better births, um, very simply for, for various different reasons. The social model of midwifery is really important uh, across the world, really, because it provides that holistic view for midwives and the, the families that they are looking out for, regardless of uh, ethnicity, race, uh, sex, gender, income, economic status, it really doesn't matter. Continuity of care in the social model of midwifery plays a huge role in protecting that sacred space for them. Um, we also have some great improved outcomes um, that we've been able to audit all the way through the sort of caseloading model of care. We'll go on to those a bit later, but the sort of improved outcomes that we haven't got sort of statistics for, but that we know is the improved mental health of not only the mother, but the father, siblings, greater, wider family. And speaking as being a caseloading midwife, I'm sure Rachel will agree, it actually improves your mental health of midwives as well. Um, it is really good. Um, I'm gonna let Rachel talk a little bit about the midwife's job satisfaction. Well, I think it, um... It improves the, the way that we work within one-to-one -one and the autonomy that we give midwives and the whole caseloading model of, of getting to know the women that they look after better. Um, we know that it improves how midwives feel about their job. I think 
anecdotally when we we speak to students who come out with us or um just people coming to have a look around they th there's less moaning heard i guess <laughs> and and more kind of job satisfaction the midwives enjoy going to work they enjoy the work that they do um we definitely have less leave for sickness within one-to-one -one midwives because of the ways that the, the midwives can manage their own diaries and, and their life. And, and there is a kind of positive role of, of self-care garnered within one-to-one -one midwives as well. So I would say, yes, definitely with, within one-to-one -one and, and even for myself, I'd say there's a definite increase in satisfaction. It is. When you work in this caseloading model of care, your passion is invigorated um, wherever you come from. So I've worked in um, a trust. I trained as a trust in a trust as a student. Um, and it, as a student, it is invigorating, empowering and exciting. And then when you go to work for whichever trust you pick, um, you, you can find that your passion and your desire to make things better even your willingness to do something above and beyond, not just for women, but for the organisations, dwindles over time. It didn't take long for me um, at all, unfortunately, which is why I chose then to work for one-to-one -one midwives. Um, it I is think just... it uh, happened a bit sooner for me. Yeah, I, I came as a newly qualified midwife. I was a student and I think at, at one point in my second year, I definitely saw myself as a delivery suite midwife. And then with the doing continuity of care and doing a caseloading module in my third year and realizing how sometimes working within the the bureaucratic structure of of well within here in the nhs i was finding that stifled all the the things that i wanted yes. to do as a midwife and so the fact that one-to-one -one was up and running by that point gave me an opportunity to kind of go right if i'm going to make this jump and i'm going to do it i'm going to do it straight off the bat of, of qualifying and coming and doing it and there. Uh, yeah, haven't looked back since. Yeah, I think no student midwife out there today, uh, particularly in the sort of England where we're having now having to pay for our fees, um, that's been taken away from us, which is a, a huge drawback to increasing our sort of staffing issues across the UK. You, you wander into this profession or you get called to this profession because you want to do it, you want to make things better. Um, it's never about the midwife, it's always about the woman and her family. And if that passion starts to dwindle you've got to be brave enough to take that everyday courage and go i've got to step outside of this i've got to redefine myself and find that passion to do something one-to-one -one midwives very fortunately opened their doors to me and i've been a passionate supporter of them since um hence we are here today with you at vidm which is great so we'll move on to the next slide so um one-to-one -one midwives, for a lot of you, particularly internationally, may not know much about us. And uh, the lovely lady in your slide there is Joanne Parkington. Uh, I've just seen her on the chat as well. So say hello, snuck Joanne, in. who snuck in <laughs> to see us. Uh, <laughs> very nice, that picture has got to go. Um, so Joanne is our CEO. She is our visionary, basically. She started this many years ago in 2010. Um, with again a passion for caseloading care for tr what people call in true midwifery. So Joanne was able to get um, a commissioned pilot study in one of our local areas to be able to prove that continuity works for improved outcomes. At this time it was just antenatal and postnatal care, there wasn't uh, insurance coverage for the intrapartum care but Joanne, with just a couple of midwives, um, was able to prove very shortly um, and probably less than the 12 months that she was given that the improved outcomes were the, um, including breastfeeding. There was improved outcomes for um, DNA or did not attends. So caseloading, you don't have a lot of do not attends because you manage that relationship, that midwife mother relationship. Um, and it just had general over prematurity rates went down, absolutely all sorts. It was an outstanding piece of work that Joe uh, leading these midwives was able to do. It began as a social enterprise and with a full on commission from that area. Um, and it has grown tremendously since then. We've sort of gone from two to three midwives to, I think there's probably over about 80 to 90 with the majority case loading, obviously the likes of my, myself and Rachel and a few others in order to support the organization and the midwives going forward. Um, 
we don't have a caseload now, but we have all come from this caseloading background. Um, we do occasionally take uh, the odd woman on just because they're usually previous service users that have been with us before, which is a great, great honour. I can't quite just take myself away from no, caseloading for No, them. not entirely. <laughs> I think we've all got a couple of women still on our caseload. Um, we just can't step away because we are that passionate about it. It brings so much joy to us and the families um, and the outcomes, regardless of what they are, are always improved, particularly for the mental health and the overall birth experience. Um, it's uh, we, we have in the UK something called the family and friends test. So this is what all uh, maternity organisations are asked to report on about the satisfaction and overall service needs. Yeah, and would you recommend it to a, a friend is the ultimate test, yes. isn't it? Would you recommend it to friends and family? And we've got this FFT test, you know, our scores range from 97 to 100 percent positive um, scores yeah. on that positive feedback so yeah. it, it shows you that the women are enjoying I think sometimes you can see some skepticism about whether continuity of care is, is that what women really want um, and I think that shows that it is what they want and it's what they enjoy um, so yeah I think it's uh, it, is, it is lovely and we, we provide this test um, sort of antenatally postnatally and post-birth so we have three sort of standards at one to one we go above and beyond as always and we ask for this test to be done after their anomaly scan around the 20-week period as well and that is to keep a check on how women are feeling about their scans and again that always comes up with a really positive feedback and um, obviously Case loading model of care doesn't quite fit the national FFT, so sometimes we'll change those. And I think generally in, UK, in the UK, they are looking at getting a better response from service users and women to be able to sort of mark how they're doing. So our next slide is the core values of one-to-one -one midwives. These were set up from the sort of very, very beginning. Um, you can probably all read them. For those of you who are just listening, though, we will just talk through them. The first one is excellence. One-to-one -one has a pioneering and creative spirit that sets us apart. We are resolute in our passion to be the best we can be to lead the world in the art and science of midwifery, to be synonymous with excellence and innovation. Then safety. Safety is the first and foremost crucial aspect of everything that we do. It is embedded in the one-to-one -one ethos and philosophy of care. Our next one is professional. At one-to-one, -one, we employ only the best. Midwives who are dedicated, who honour the relationship they have with women. Midwives, midwives who are privileged to be part of a woman's birthing experience. Integrity. At all times, we will act with respect, integrity, reliability and responsibility. We will carry out our role in a responsible and professional manner. And the last one is woman-centred. We will advocate, support and empower women in our care in a non-judgmental and inclusive manner. And that is really at the heart of it, at the key of it. Being woman-centred is a totally different way from working from other trusts and the NHS and the organisation. Our care is totally centred around them. We will go to their homes. We will take the lead from them as to where they feel they are along their pregnancy journey. They may very wish at the booking appointment to talk about absolutely everything. They may want to talk about just birth. They may want to talk about the first 12 weeks. They may want to talk about their greatest fears and concerns, or they may want to talk about the complexities of care that they're gonna face. There's no set agenda at this point. We will take the lead from then. And often our booking appointment is the greatest opportunity to start that bond of the midwife mother relationship. We will probably spend about two hours with that family. Um, and it is often very much a family inclusive event. We've got children running around. There are husbands present. We've had mothers, mother-in-laws. We've had nans, uh, friends, absolutely everybody. And we welcome them all to this one-to-one -one caseloading model of care they are the leaders in their care so it has to we have to follow them almost um, the safety aspect is absolutely key we cannot go away from that um, we are not an organization that promotes normal birth at all costs uh, we know a lot in the UK recently there's been some rather bad poor press reported of midwives attempting to um, have normal births for women 
one-to-one -one midwives it normal birth would be great but it's their outcome that matters their outcomes aren't just based on did you have a vaginal birth it's how satisfied were with your whole pregnancy journey did you have the right outcome for you did you feel involved in the choices that you made were you the leader in your care as midwives, we navigate the care, but we should never lead the care. It should always be the woman and the family that lead in the care. And we will get a lot of women who come to us who perhaps they felt pigeonholed within normal maternity services. And our midwives work excellently to be able to provide them with the most up to date evidence and help them to interpret that. And we expect our midwives to be able to critically analyse all recent research that comes out in order to be able to care for these women who have otherwise perhaps otherwise would eschew normal services um, and look for free birthing or, or that kind of stuff. So yeah, we, we will offer, we will um, offer to, to the women absolutely every single choice. OK, we can't actually do uh, elective cesareans at home and things like that, but we will provide them with that choice and that opportunity if that is what they are wanting. But what we generally find, um, and it increases as time goes by, is if women are truly informed about their choices, they will usually generally go for a home assessment and a home birth or a normal birth within a local acute trust and the NHS. Our safety measures are paramount. We have a very strong um, governance department who sort of leads the way in the safety measures that we have around the midwives and the women and our other staff. It is a very positive governance department and that is unique as far as I'm concerned within the uh, or outside the NHS in the UK at the moment. Um, it is led by one of our colleagues, Kelly, Kelly Ralphs, who she is also case loaded with a one to one um, model of care. Um, and she is supported by Sarah Hayward in that department as well. And they lead a very positive um, midwife focused governance departments that spend a lot of time with midwives involved um, in perhaps incidents or things like that, reflecting on it, getting to the bottom of why it is. When we have big incidents in the UK, they have to go through what's called an RCA, a root cause analysis. It is a really fantastic approach. Um, I think it's actually slightly pinched from the aviation industry, but it is um, a really good in-depth approach. I've seen many of these done in many trusts. And for one-to-one -one midwives, one of the key parts of this is to involve the women and the families from the very, very beginning. And they are present in the room as the leaders of their care amongst the multidisciplinary teams, different trusts, um, clinical commissioning groups, and they lead that sort of analysis of their care and that is really positive that is taking women right to the heart of their care even when things don't go as planned our other safety aspects are a lot of what we call complex care planning so we know um, complexities in women is really really growing at the moment from anything from maternal age BMI epilepsy um, cardiac is a massive concern in the embrace UK reports currently and it's about planning right from the very beginning. It's about midwives being these navigators of care, being able to access the care that they need all the way through and being able to make those choices on all the evidence that we have. And I think if we go back you know, to the title of our presentation about reclaiming mid midwifery, and that's what we're doing, you can't, you can't reclaim midwifery for midwives unless you help women reclaim birth and, and pregnancy for themselves. So ultimately, that is what we're trying to do at one to one, give the, the birth and the decisions back to them and, and assist them and go back to being midwives, being these signposters and, and, and guide us through pregnancy care. Um, so this is ultimately where we're, we're getting it from. And we're making maternity services better by helping women to, to take control. It is because we we have our professional integrity to uphold um, and, th and by that we we're not pressurizing these women. We're not influencing their decision making. So we are providing the information they need to make those decisions. And it's really and it's truly inspiring watching these families grow and educate themselves and become empowered through all the different services that we offer. Um, and it is a true sort of it's empowering for midwives. It's absolutely fantastic to be able to sort of do this. Um, and it, it, yeah, you have to take it. It's really just an inspirational way to work. Right, we're going to nip on to the next one now. <laughs> just shocked Rachel me. here and pointed her. <laughs> so things that we find help us in, in what we're trying to do is we, we talk very much to women about 
what birth is and we help them to ready themselves and prepare. I think a lot of women who purport to be anxious around birth is it's more of a kind of anxiety of the unknown. Um, so we do a lot of work with the women that we look after to teach them about the hormones of pregnancy and labour to understand what their body is actually doing. Um, we have started introducing classes on optimal fetal positioning so they actually understand what their baby's doing and what their general day-to-day -day activities what that impact is on, on their birth and um, teaching them about labour, the, the length of labour. One of the things that we have done is introduce hypnobirthing as a kind of standard element of our maternity care. So we will offer it to, to all ladies. We've trained all midwives or we're aiming to train all midwives in hypnobirthing, whether they teach it or not, because what we do want is that midwives can help women who are hypnobirthing in their birth, whether they teach it or not, to be able to what's the word I'm looking for? Facilitate that uh, that experience. I think you can sometimes, I mean, I remember back as a student seeing a lady come in who was hypnobirthing and the staff around had no idea what it was or how to help facilitate that. And I don't think that that helped with her birth at all. So, you know, I've witnessed it within family as well in, in different areas. So for us to be able to have midwives who can help with that and, and teach these women, we can provide extra classes that are dibbing, it's the, for some of them, there's a small minimal cost to it, others are free and part of the service. Um, obviously, continuity, just to explain how continuity works within one-to-one, -one, um, we have teams of midwives between around six to eight is where we should have it. And within those teams, we have buddy pairs, so two to three midwives in a buddy pair. Each of those midwives has a caseload of up to 32 women at any one or time, give or take. You know, sometimes you have those busy months like we did after the World Cup. Yes. Suddenly everybody's <laughs> pregnant. So you have a caseload around 32. And as a, as a caseload of midwife, you're expected to see those women for all their routine antenatal care. Um, so your bookings, you work, you have... How many weeks off do we give them these days? Uh, currently 63 <laughs> days is how much 63 we days of annual leave and it works where you and your buddy cannot be off at the same time. You, the women get the continuity by seeing that named midwife but then also knowing that if their midwife is off on annual leave it'll only be one other that you should be seeing or two if they're in a, a care of three. We additionally have, um, you can see up there, a mama as a midwife and mother assistant. So by any other name maybe known as a, a healthcare yeah. assistant or a midwifery support worker they fulfill a function a number of functions for us but kind of act for breastfeeding support they can um go and do baby cares they provide parental teaching lessons um education lessons some of them do teach hypnobirthing as well so they work in a in a group just to provide that continuum through pregnancy um women may see other, other midwives, so we have centering sessions and the hypnobirthing might be taught by a midwife they've never met before. But overall, um, you know, we're, we're achieving 98.9% .9 continuity for women through routine antenatal appointments. Um, and this is the, the satisfaction that is reflected in the FHT scores that we talked about before. Um, the midwives, in, a, in order to be able to manage that caseload of 32 women, have full autonomy over their own diary. We provide them with a diary and that's about as far as we go with it as to, to what we want to do. So it's for them to judge how they book those appointments in. Um, we give them some guidance about, you know, a longer appointment. We're not asking them to do 10 minutes and see however many women in one day. So it's for them to judge how long you send. So some women you'll see for an hour, some you might still be there two and a half hours later, some half an hour, you've got to judge that individually with each woman. And those midwives can choose to do lots of appointments in one day or a couple of appointments spread over seven days, but we are expecting them to be on call um, for six of those seven days a week. So they do get a day protected time just to keep on top of paperwork and have a little bit of a brain breather, a little yeah. bit of self-care. Um, I think the on-call scares a lot of people with the continuity model of case loading, but because you're a case loading for your women, you are not called out every single night. You are probably called out on average. If you have four women due, you're going to have four calls out overnight through that case loading model of care. You will get the odd triage call, 
But again, because we've gone back to the basics of protecting this continuity and we have taught the physiology of pregnancy, we have taught the physiology of labour, we have explained a lot of what to expect in the next few months, you won't get a lot of those triage calls. The antenatal education is key to be able to sort of build that midwife-mother relationship and they trust you and you trust them. And it is really important. People are very afraid of a case-loading model of care because of the call-outs and interruptions. But it is not sort of part of that. Now, don't get me wrong, caseloading sort of becomes part of your life. You have to accept that. But your triage calls can be any time of the day. They are mostly in the day as well, because women are also still um, sort of observant of your life and observant of the fact they don't want to interrupt you. Um, but they will. They'll send a text, they'll phone and things like that. Going back to the physiology, this is how we're protecting the continuity. Um, as Rachel has said, we work in very small groups of two to three. Currently, the Better Birth is advocating working in teams of sort of six to eight midwives. But for sort of continuity to truly work, caseloading to truly work, it needs to be much smaller on that basis of two to three midwives. Six to eight midwives, I'm sure many will remember, particularly in the UK, is going back to where team midwifery was. Now, we had a big push um, before my time as a midwife, there was mid midwifery 2020 and changing childbirth, all advocating continuity, all pushing it forward. And it's taken up until better births for a real sort of national driver to be able to do this. But we, what we need to do is protect that continuity so the message doesn't get lost. If we're saying that everybody has a named midwife in a team of six to eight, are we really providing continuity? Because will that woman still see eight? different midwives through her pregnancy. It is not, in my opinion, and Rachel may agree with you, may agree with me, or you all out there listening may agree, but we need it to be that sort of two to three midwives. And that goes through to the intrapartum care as well. Um, intrapartum care, as we all know, birth happens within usually about a five to six week period. So um, we've recently had a, a lady on Virtual International Day, the midwife who birthed her child at 43 plus two weeks, who was informed, empowered and made that decision and was supported by her named midwife. Due to annual leave and things like that, our midwives don't always make that uh, intrapartum continuity, but that's when your buddy group comes into action so that there is another person and they will meet them. Even if they've not met them, they will have had a telephone conversation with them. They might meet them at centering or hip birthing. It's really important. The personalised care part of it is um, really, really important to that woman taking that lead and feeling in control of her pregnancy. The individualised care plans come for uh, planning right from the very beginning. So women are assessed as they all go along and have input into their sort of what we call risk assessments. Um, they sort of plan the care, they choose the care. We will be very, very blunt and ask that question, is this what you want to do? What would you like to do here? Our recommendations are this, but what do you want to do? When they get to the sort of intrapartum care for those women with complexities, they have a very detailed individualised care plan outlying uh, everything that they need to know. OK, so that is the good and the bad. We are very, very honest with this. And then they can make that decision. And what the true beauty of our booking visits and our care all the way along is that we don't ask women and families to make decisions on where they're choosing to birth until they are in labour. Because that is when you form that relationship, that is when a woman will feel totally different. So we give them that option. We can facilitate a uh, home birth, we can arrange support in labour, we will support a woman if she wishes to go elsewhere, but we don't hang on to that initial where would you like to have your baby chat right at the very beginning. And that is the very start of empowering a woman. The other beauty of, of continuity care and, and providing this personalised care is that if you're only seeing one midwife all the time, you don't have to repeat yourself. And what you've seen, and there's, there's some research on this, is that if women have to keep repeating themselves, they start to leave out information and therefore don't end up telling that fourth, fifth, sixth midwife that they've seen the whole story, which then you, how can any midwife prepare a proper kind of care plan for a lady who's not telling you everything? Whereas those midwives who've seen that lady appointment after appointment, they've got that whole view of that pregnancy and can assist her in making those kind of more personalised plans. Um, 
you know, we're talking about flexible visits and time and length. You know, we we fit, the, the the women and the midwives have a, a mutual respect, I think, for not always requesting appointments at half past seven on a Friday evening um, or nine o'clock on a Sunday morning. But you, you get a little bit of that. But, you know, there's the, that mutual respect where they work together to put those appointments in that continuum into a, a kind of nice good for each other i think yes julie roberts has just made a comment there maternity care providers need to invest in services to ensure continuity of carer and not just pay lip service to the concept julie i couldn't agree more there are a lot of models going along at the moment in order to hit the targets laid out by better births and the nhs long-term plan uh, initially of i think it's 20 to 25 percent and then by 2020 50 percent continuity this uh it, they are going to struggle and they're trying to do it because they need to make that target basically that's been set national by the national drivers but a lot of places are doing it by having elective cesarean section teams um endocrine disorder teams for diabetes and things like that which is good these women are of no less value they are just as important however what we've got to understand is the better births and is about improving the outcomes for these women. Now their outcome of continuity and satisfaction over their birth experiences and birth choices may be increased, but where was the maternal outcome? Where was the physical, back to the physiology? Where was their improved outcome? Where was the improved outcome for the baby? Where was the improved outcome for the family? The caseloading model of care, and we are very passionate, as I'm sure you can understand, is the way forward. And that is for all women of all risk factors, of all previous birth experiences. Caseloading and model of care needs to be kept at the front and the forefront of better births in the NHS long term plan. Okie doke. So, how is this achieved? How, where have we come from so far? Partnership working is a really key point to be able to be able to access these resources um to be able to provide the full care so as lead navigators for the women the partnership work we have to do is obviously with the care quality commission um, maternity voice partnerships are a current sort of real buzz about them in the uk about getting women involved and things like that the maternity voice partnerships should be led by a service user so these need to be led um constructively with a bit of coaching for that person to be able to sort of manage this and it's about truly listening to the women's voices um one of the main sort of points here you can see is women and families that's always at the top of our list to listen to our women and our families they provide us with the knowledge and the push and the drive to be able to take the service forward one to one we, we try to be quite proactive as opposed to reactive so you know when women are giving us ideas and things that they think could improve our service the nature of one-to-one -one, there's there's only a few layers of, of kind of management that we have to go through in order to enact a change so we can make changes really quickly to to suit women and, and what they're telling us would benefit them in their care i mean we, we have had to remove ourselves that the whole reason that one-to-one -one works is that we are commissioned so we're commissioned by uh, clinical commissioning groups but we are independent we are an independent group who've been commissioned so we had to we had to un like break down midwifery and what it was in maternity care and then put it together in a new way to to solve those problems in maternity care that normal services were, were struggling with and that's what we've had to do and i would say if we were thinking about the major walls that we come across it is because we are thinking outside of the box with things and we're, we're trying to work in partnership with these people but i will be honest and say that it's not always there are a lot of challenges not always a partnership <laughs> we are overcoming these challenges bit by bit slowly by slow slowly slowly building these relationships and overcoming these challenges um but mm. it is difficult but we have that passion behind us equally we're under a lot of scrutiny um because of that you know, it, it, i think we've probably been inspected more times than we wish to remember whereas other services in the local area perhaps haven't been under such a an eager eye so yeah it, it comes with its challenges but again over time over the years that we've been practicing that is changing now it still because is. <laughs> they are realizing that we are a safe service and that we do truly provide midwifery care one of the other sort of groups that we work in partnership with and uh, listen to a lot is over on this side our midwives 
okay we cannot provide this service without our midwives and we have to listen to them and formulate ongoing innovations and plans with them and they if you listen to the midwives they they have a massive vast amounts of experience and ideas and plans and part of it is about grabbing those midwives and supporting them letting them sort of feel out their plans and what they need to do and things like that not everyone the plans work not everyone's already going to be put into place but it's about respecting those midwives for their ideas we welcome innovation we welcome new practice we welcome everybody that thinks outside the box to be able to do this um public health england is uh, obviously one of our governing bodies here and i am going to leave this to rachel but i have to say rachel has done some fantastic work in the past 12 months by engaging and uh, listening with public health england and being able to show them what one-to-one -one are well they the public health have recently become kind of a part of the commissioning service previously they were just kind of putting there the the antenatal and newborn program that those of you working in the uk will be aware but now they're part of that commissioning service so they're looking at us quite closely as to what we we do and and i have to say i think i think they were expecting not not so good stuff <laughs> So when I've I've been working with them to show them what we do and how we do it, I think they've been quite pleasantly surprised about how continuity of care and this caseload in community model can actually improve these um, public health initiatives that are that are going out there. So um, it's been quite interesting working with them, and and that it's not quite the same uh, overlook that the the CCGs have over us, but they they are looking at us and seeing what we're doing, and the the key performance indicators that obviously if there's any screening coordinators listening you'll know exactly what I'm talking about the submission of those every quarter as to how we are keeping up with those and if I look at our outcomes compared to local local trusts which I get to see you know we are beating them in some areas and, and very close to them in others um, I think one of the things that does become a little bit of a, a stick in the mud is because we give women true informed choice over what they're having we do get a proportion of women who decline and this is a big sticking point and, and in some ways they see a decline as, as that's a, a missed opportunity but that it should be rectified and I have to sit there and fight for the fact that women can decline things if they wish to and then you know we have fully informed them and because they have that full information about everything that we're offering them that's why we do get a little bit a few more declines from, than others and I think that was the that would be the only area where we we kind of fall down slightly is in that number but it's, it's not a falling down it's just a true representation of women having all that information as yeah. opposed to stick your arm out and have some blood tests but you don't really know what they are it's going back to reclaiming the midwifery for the midwives um, and supporting the women to reclaim birth for them um, and their pregnancy and they do have the right everybody has the right that's why we're all midwives to stand up support and advocate is the right of a human being to make the decisions about their own care and um, there couldn't be anything more fundamental than that and it is just a, a fabulous way to work in this case loading model that is, is an accepted part of this care um, the local acute trust that we work with we have had to form relationship with them and they are improving rapidly from where we started but we have to be quite formidable in our presence there we have to be able to form sort of communication pathways outside of the sort of more national parts of uh, finance and things like that and i'm sure joe may pop a comment on very quickly about the national tariff joe is working alongside those to be able to make the national tariff suitable for what it actually is because we all have national tariffs for charging cross-boundary working which is again what better births is saying but that is the sticking point currently is this cross-boundary working and partnership working there has to be a greater level of input for uh, financial sort of um challenges basically to be able to do it to value what the work that is being done not just by us but by other people as well but again it's all down to sort of income and we know that the nhs is massively underfunded but we get paid no more than the nhs we get paid exactly the same for our work so the national tariffs and the standards but it is it's a huge part of it there needs to be a shake-up across the uk because of this Okay, doc. So we do like to celebrate our outcomes and we do like to celebrate our midwives. 
our sort of private group chat for all of our midwives absolutely promote celebration. So one of the greatest uh, sort of innovations, I suppose, was what we call the birth selfie. So when midwives have been to a, a home birth and they, they will then group together, sometimes involving um, the women post. and <laughs> the lamp, the lamp post <laughs> is very common in them. Sometimes it involves a whole family with their consent and they will put on this and it inspires midwives to keep going. It is absolutely um, it, it, it's nice it's like people are out there supporting you regardless of what you're doing what day or time and night and things like that so there's a lot of celebration going on within one-to-one -one as well I'm sure Excuse you can read sorry, Jill and Rachel I just want to give you a five minute um warning that we're gonna have to leave the room in five minutes <laughs> um for those of you who are just listening on your phone and things like that the outcomes for home birth so that's women starting their home birth journey bills we have an instrumental delivery rate so that's forceps or uh, von twos of 4.9 percent we have an emergency cesarean section rate of 4.9 percent our small for gestational age in the uk which is considered below the 10th centile of growth is 0.2 our third degree perineal tears are very low at 1.3% and we have a 0% fourth degree perineal tear. Uh, Rachel? For, for all births, you know, our stillbirth rate is, is below the national average at 0.2%, 2% um, for third to fourth degree perineal tears. We've got 560 women who have uh, attended hyp hypnobirthing classes and a 2.2% um prematurity rate so births below 34 weeks so you know we could we can talk to you all day but i think these numbers are quite you know, they they tell you it without yeah, us needing to talk about it, it. Is, it is these are all well below national averages um it, it speaks for itself it speaks for itself even for the women not choosing home birth it speaks for itself and that's what needs to be listened to our continuity rates are great um, just under 100 percent for antenatal and postnatal slightly lower for intrapartum due to annual leave and midwives lives but even that is fantastic um, and it is just really really important our normal vaginal delivery rate whatever you want to call it is really really high regardless um, of the outcomes but we're always striving to make it better we lay down challenges to our midwives to make it better okay service user feedback is really really important to us um i'll just read it out for you for those who are just listening on the phone one-to-one -one offered lots more flexibility i already had a one-year-old daughter and with a busy work schedule attending hospital appointments would have proved difficult and that was philippa one of our one-to-one -one mums um, and then Kim's passion for hypnobirthing helped to eliminate my fear of giving birth and gave me the confidence to birth our beautiful baby at home for the most perfect start to our life as a little family, another one of our mums. So, you know, the, this is the sort of feedback we get on a, a regular basis. Women are enjoying what we're doing and definitely gives us a fire in our belly to carry on, even in even in the darker hours, of which there are some, um, you know, it's still it's stuff like this and, and the, the cars you get from women and the feedback from women. Um, so, excuse me, sorry, um, Rachel and Jill, I just need to interrupt here. We actually are going to have to leave this room in two minutes. So if you want to just give a couple um, closing words, and I believe if you want to share your information in the public chat, if people would like to ask you questions or engage with you, um with more um input or insight then uh you can make that public and people can do that out of the session closing words very very difficult but for midwives everywhere across across the world remember your passion remember why you came to this remember your calling uh, true midwifery or case loading midwifery continuity of carer is vital to protect midwives for the future um, we need to hang on to it, we need to advocate for it, we need to fight for it, not just for ourselves, but for women, for babies, for partners, for families, for everything. We have got to protect us and midwifery in order to protect the people that we care for. Rachel, would you like to say anything? I don't, I don't think I can top that, Jill. I think I'll uh, <laughs> leave that there. Thank we you very would, much. We would like to thank you all very, very much for listening. We would like to thank VD, VIDM as well. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, we will support it again um, next year. We hope you will take this and sort of get that fire in your belly and to go off and be um, midwives again. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Lots of great comments. And we do hope that you guys will reach out to Rachel and Jill um, to ask great questions. 